So I would first like to uh, give a, a big thank you to the staff at uh, Center for East Asian Studies, uh, Director Charles Kim, Associate Director David Fields, and Assistant Director Lori Dennis, uh, who is here uh, with us uh, today on Zoom, um, and also to everyone else on the staff and, and steering committee that has made this summer uh, teaching pedagogy conference possible. Um, so I would like to, I, there was some, I saw sent messages in the chat saying where they were from. If you could just quick type in your name, um, where you're from and what you do, um, because uh, me and Lori know you, but uh, you may not know each other. So let's just take a brief uh, 30 seconds to a minute to type in your name, where you're from, and then what you do. And while people are doing that, um, so I will give you a little bit of background. The Center for East Asian Studies, uh, it's a focal point connecting East Asia to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's one of UW-Madison's eight federally funded national resource centers. So Center for East Asian Studies is dedicated to all aspects of research, education, and outreach related to East Asia, so China, Korea, and Japan. Today is the uh, pedagogy workshop um, that's, like I said, previously split into a few parts. And um, for people that may not know me, my name is Brennan Dowling. I am a PhD candidate at the Asian Languages and Cultures Department, University of Wisconsin-Madison. I study Chinese linguistics, um, but I'm also interested in uh, focusing on how speakers of Chinese in the United States uh, vary their language from speakers of Chinese in China and elsewhere. But that's not what has brought me here today. Um, I'm here today uh, for my second interest, which is uh, pedagogy. Uh, and I am uh, very delighted to be here and to have uh, great people who will be presenting today and tomorrow uh, to also uh, be with us. And I hope that everybody is, um, my goal is to hope, I hope that everybody is able to uh, get something out of today um, and get a new perspective on uh, different topics uh, such as hip hop and, and popular culture and, and East Asia. Okay, great. So session one, uh, I'll just be giving a brief background of uh, hip hop in East Asia uh, influence and, and input. And then I'll be discussing, that'll be the first part. Um, sorry, there's the outline, the roadmap for today. So background information and then comments and criticism uh, on uh, East Asian uh, hip hop. And let's get started. So um, I'd like to, again, uh, utilize the chat here. Um, when seeing hip hop, uh, what comes to your mind uh, when you see this word or, or hear this word? If you could please uh, just type in the chat uh, a short phrase or sentence. Um, so let's uh, take a few moments to go ahead and talk about uh, and comment on what you think of when you hear hip hop or see the word hip hop. We have some comments coming in. Edgy lyrics, culture, America counterculture, yeah, mainstream, West Coast, art form originally, lyrics about society and urban life, unfamiliar culture, cool and original. Anything else? Political discourse. Rhyme, great, great. Great, so I'm seeing a lot of great uh, comments in there. Um, and one of my main goals today with this presentation, besides um, giving people uh, information, uh, maybe possibly new information or, or just expanding on knowledge that you may know, is also to um, enforce the idea that uh, hip hop um, as a global movement, um, and as, as not only as a genre of music, but also a uh, culture um, that's rooted in Black America 
um, and that's rooted in um, um, social justice movements, but also um, has become a, uh, a commodity, like somebody uh, mentioned uh, in the chat there, that has been adapted uh, and has been uh, molded um, by different countries across the world and has um, became localized and, and uh, but still at the same time preserved um, to its original uh, beginnings. So, um, great, yeah, hearing stories while listening to music. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, storytellers. Is... So um, what I'm going to share with you now are uh, brief introductions to uh, Japanese, Korean, and, and Chinese hip hop, um, and to uh, show them as uh, not only uh, global hip hop borrowers, but also contributors uh, back to global hip hop. So first, uh, Japan, uh, Japanese hip hop. Um, this uh, one of the pioneers, uh, Fujiwara uh, DJ, who some may know now um, as a uh, streetwear designer, uh, who's influenced uh, brands like Nike and um, uh, Bathe and Ape. Um, but back in uh, the 19, early 1980s, um, he was uh, playing in Japanese nightclubs, uh, hip hop music. Um, from the United States, specifically from the birthplace of hip hop in New York City, um, which was uh, something that he had uh, picked up when he was uh, in uh, New York City and, and uh, being involved there in the uh, hip hop scene or, or, or I guess viewing and, and being a part of the, the hip hop scene from his perspective, um, he picked up a lot of things and, and music was one of them and DJing was one of them. So he brought that back to Japan and, and put that in the nightclubs. And from there, the nightclubs in Japan became, um, as uh, scholar Ian Kanji says, the genbas for uh, Japanese hip hop. So the place where not only you have Black American hip hop being introduced, but also you have uh, Japanese language and different customs being introduced as well at the same time. So it's creating this, uh, uh, creating Japanese uh, hip hop, a, a variance of, of global hip hop. Um, and uh, so this becomes sort of the breeding ground uh, for Japanese hip hop. and um, and, and from then on, uh, uh, Japanese hip hop artists are, um, and even mainstream artists are going through uh, Japanese hip hop, um, they're going through underground nightclubs, going through nightclubs in Tokyo as a sort of uh, way to uh, uh, pay respects to, you could say, the birthplace of Japanese hip hop, which were those um, nightclubs. And then there's also other artists like uh, Rhyme Mester, um, who was formed in 1989. These uh, their their songs and specific one of their songs uh b-boyism has been uh played uh for several decades now uh in in battle rap uh, scenes in japan um and is um a, a group that's that's one of the pioneers of japanese shop and then you have king kidra uh who in uh, 1995 um experimented a lot with uh intricate uh, rhyming and um co complex rhyme schemes so that's a little bit of Japanese hip hop. Um, Korean hip hop, yeah, did anybody, I saw somebody's video pop up, anybody have, sorry, I might be going, let me just pause right there. Is there any questions or am I going a little bit too fast? Um, is uh, everything here that I'm articulating, uh, am I articulating it uh, so that people are um, able to take notes or are able to just process everything? Okay, I see it so far so good in the chats. Okay, all right, just let me know if I'm going a little bit too fast. Um, and I clicked too fast as well. So we're actually here at uh, Korean hip hop. <laughs> um, so Korean hip hop, um, also around the same time, so uh, late 80s, uh, early 90s. Um, and uh, some of the pioneers of, of Korean hip hop here, uh, Chen Jin Yong, um, he's uh, a very uh, specific uh, individual. Um, there's uh, been discussions uh, and uh, comments that um, his, uh, well, first, he was very uh, popular and made uh, music um, that was hip hop influenced uh, and released his debut album in 1990. Um, and he was, uh, became signed to a, a label and was um, uh, taken very seriously uh, as a uh, player in K-pop. Um, as a major figure in K-pop, and um, but unfortunately uh, he had a, a demise, uh, which was um, a, a battle with drug addiction, um, and uh, so he kind of fell off. Uh, but is still um, around. Um, and then you have uh, the uh, Sutiji boy uh, and boys, Sutiji and boys, 
they were kind of like a K-pop boy band, but they came onto the scene uh, doing a hip hop inspired uh, dance um, music, uh, rap music. Um, but they branched off a little bit from that and, and um, talked about and challenged uh, uh, social issues and uh, were later uh, censored. Um, and then you have uh, Drunken Tiger, which uh, was a hip hop group uh, in Korea in the late uh, 1990s. Uh, and they created this uh, movement crew, uh, which was a hip hop community in, in Korea, um, which uh, birthed a lot of different groups. So you see in, in Japan, you see Korea, popular uh, music uh, being influencing hip hop music and also of course global hip hop influencing uh, the, the local. Um, but then you also see uh, this new variant which is their combination of their local customs with global customs um, influencing then their domestic uh, pop culture uh, just like uh, you see uh, in, in the United States. Um, especially now it's, it's very obvious that uh, hip hop music um, is uh, mainstream and a lot of it uh, is influence pop culture heavily. And you see the same things here in, in Japan and Korea and in China, although it was a very uh, long uh, road, uh, I think for, for China and possibly a road that um, people did not see coming in that specific way, um, specifically um, with 2017, the TV show, rap reality TV show called The Rap of China. A lot of uh, scholars mark that as the time uh, where uh, Chinese hip hop was commodified and, and was uh, really taken uh, serious by uh, big companies and, and used to, um, to uh, kind of make uh, pop idols. And to, to uh, 2017 was really the mark of Chinese hip hop going into the mainstream. But before that, I mean, there's a very uh, serious history, just like there is in China, and, or sorry, in Korea and Japan. But first, before I start saying that, I just want to preface this with that this presentation here, and specifically when I'm referring to Chinese hip hop, I am referring only to mainland China only. So I just want to make sure that that's clear there. Um, so in the 1990s, you have uh, Dai Bing, uh, who, uh, along with his girlfriend, um, Tian Bao, they created the group uh, Didi Rhythm. Um, he, before that, was singing uh, disco covers and, 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 and covering them in, in, in English um, before he started uh, uh, rapping. Um, and uh, at this time, there's no true community or, as Kanji says, Jenba for uh, Chinese hip hop yet. Um, it's really just a, a handful of, of people here and there putting out music uh, that's uh, heavily inspired in Dai Bing, in his case, uh, with Didi Rhythm. Uh, most of the lyrics are in English, uh, which is not uh, his first language. So you have uh, people like Dai Bing in the early 90s. And then, um, like I said, there's really no community yet, um, or, or Jenba, right, as Kanji says. Uh, but then in, in the early 2000s, um, you see a, uh, a man by the name of uh, Dana Burton, uh, goes by a nickname Showtime, uh, from Detroit. Uh, Black American coming to China uh, in the early 2000s and uh, bringing the Detroit uh, rap battle scene, um, rap battle competition uh, stage to Chinese cities and giving, in a sense, a platform for uh, young Chinese youth um, and, and giving a, a space for, uh, for hip hop and specifically for freestyle and this has kind of been the way of, uh, of, you see a lot of uh, hip hop artists in China going through uh, this stage, this freestyle stage uh, that, that uh, Burton gave and um, MCs gaining uh, skills and, and recognition. And one of them was MC Weber, um, who went on to form the group uh, with a few others uh, called Yin Tong, um, which uh, was essentially China's first uh, mainstream, arguably their probably China's first mainstream breakthrough in 2003 um, with their album, We Serve the People. Um, and MC Weber went through uh, and was in a way mentored uh, by Dana through Iron Mike. Um, and then you also have High Bomb, which a year later in 2004 uh, also released a, their debut album. Um, they were a Shanghai group, um, and but both groups uh, were signed to major record labels and, and were marketed and, and went on tour. So, like I said, East Asian countries, they created their own variant of hip hop but they're not um, independent of, of each other. And um, 
as I'll hint here in, in James in his presentation, uh, we'll expand on uh, East Asia, especially in popular culture, um, has uh, uh, influenced the uh, East Asian popular culture has in some ways influenced hip hop. I'll leave that to James to talk about. I'll stop uh, there with that uh, because his presentation does a great job of exploring that topic. But within East Asia, you see Korea's uh, Jinu San um, influencing China's uh, Hei Bang. And Heibang does covers of one of their songs, and, and Heibang also does different covers of uh, Korean uh, K-pop, Korean hip-hop uh, songs. And then also you see in some uh, instances, uh, it's been mentioned that in China, nightclubs in, in the 90s, um, Korean and Japanese international students. So you have like this international uh, presence from other East Asian countries in China playing Chinese hip-hop, or sorry, not Chinese hip-hop music, just playing hip-hop music in general in the, in the nightclubs there. And then you also have Japan's Yellow Music Orchestra, which was like in the 70s and 80s electronic uh, instrumental group um, who created electronic inspired uh, instrumentals, which um, were picked up in the early 80s and some people uh, by Africa Bombada and some people believe that that they played an uh, indirect role in the, that early electronic hip hop sound that uh, Africa Bombada really helped uh, bring into the mainstream and you know bring to uh, different uh, punk rock crowds in, in Manhattan and whatnot. Um, and again, these are just uh, examples of how East Asian uh, nations, they contribute to each other and, and their respective uh, scenes here. And I think one um, uh, influence, which is, uh, so those were kind of like the influences in the early days. And I think in recent years, you see a really big influence here in East Asian hip hop, um, a Donald B. K-pop and Korean popular uh, music. Um, and uh, in specific, what you see is uh, K-pop, influence on China's commercialization of hip hop. And more specifically, like I mentioned with the TV show in 2017, The Rap of China, um, that was a show um, that uh, was uh, really a, a, a replica of uh, Show Me the Money, a Korean uh, television rap TV show, um, except without the uh, permissions. Uh, and so this was um, uh, involuntary kind of indirectly k-pop influenced uh the the rise of of commercial uh hip-hop music in china um and then also to the just the fact that they had the rapid china had the face of their uh show as a uh as chris Wu, who maybe a lot some of your students may know um he's a chinese canadian uh, k-pop boy man member now a uh, convicted sexual assault uh, offender uh very serious crimes uh, and is serving a, i believe a 13 uh, year prison stint um but before that, uh, he was the face of this rap of China. And, um, uh, but like I said, the rap of China was not a licensed version and uh, it received a lot of scrutiny, even from the producers of, of Show Me the Money. And, uh, you know, because it just imitated uh, the show um, without the, having a true license, um, like uh, Show Me the Money had in, in different countries and in Southeast Asia. And in this way, you see K-pop, uh, uh, involuntarily contributing to right, the commercialization of, of Chinese hip hop. And so there's just consistent influences, several in instances of influences between the East Asian nations. Uh, and these are just a few examples. One more comment uh, before I move on to uh, the last section of the presentation is uh, what is potentially, uh, what has been talked about in discussions of, of East Asian uh, hip hop and in, in scholarship and in discussions about authenticity and, and uh, international people in, in different places, is this uh, the, the fact that the earliest pioneers in these three countries in Korea, Japan, and China, um, they all had something in common. And, um, you know, whether it was Chen Jinyong and, and his, uh, what he cited his inspiration and the people who showed him how to, how to rhyme and, and to dance um, as being, uh, uh, Kid, children of uh, Black American soldiers in Korea in the 70s and 80s, or if it was uh, Fujiwara with his presence uh, in the birthplace of uh, in, in New York City, um, or China's MC Weber, who is crowned uh, MC three years in a row uh, in, in, in Dana Burton's uh, Iron Mike freestyle battle competition. They all, all of these artists shared a, a mutual interest um, with uh, preserving Black American culture, specifically hip hop culture, and specifically here in these instances, creating a, a global hip hop uh, phenomenon. Um, and in a way, 
this kind of um, leads to um, some some questions is you see like these artists who are um, not just imitating something that they hear or, or see on TV, but they have a personal connection to. Um, and this brings up a lot of questions that have been talked about in, in discussions surrounding Chinese hip hop and East Asian hip hop about authenticity, um, you know, and and also of of input. Uh, and if you have direct input uh, from the source, uh, does that make you authentic? Okay, well then what does authentic mean? Um, and also, is there a need uh, to have a direct input from the source if you are learning about the culture and if you are um, doing uh, things to preserve uh, hip hop culture, do you need that input from somebody um, that is belongs to the hip hop community um, or even just a, a black American that happens to be in East Asia um, working or, or they're doing, studying? Um, so is there an ideal input? Um, I would just have you think about that for a moment um, and we will get back to that um, towards the end of the presentation. So the last part of this presentation, it's um, talking about comments that have came up when discussing East Asian hip hop. And really these are topics which can be talked about and um, in, in hip hop in general. But for the specific purposes of this presentation, I would like to introduce these major topics in the censorship, authenticity, and localization as it applies to China. Um, but uh, I would just also like to, again, note that these are comments uh, that in general can apply to East Asian hip hop and, and, and to, and to hip hop in general, but I'll be specific here and use China as a case study for discussing these. And these are also some of, based on some of the comments in, that we received from attendees. Um, so if you haven't uh, sent questions in that survey, um, that's perfectly okay. We have uh, a handful of questions that people sent in there. Um, and um, I tried to, uh, I saw that a lot of people were discussing censorship. So I think that's something that uh, is, is important to, to discuss here. I mean, it's a big issue, right? Censorship is a big issue. Like when people mention China in general, it doesn't even have to be specific like the Chinese hip hop community. Just whenever somebody talks about China, censorship somehow is always getting into the conversation. Um, so it makes sense that uh, we're focusing it here on today and and the attendees that brought this up. Um, I think that uh, uh, in a country where censorship is so overt, um, certain things are going to be rare and, and specifically things that challenge authority, you know, so like political or social critiques are going to be rare. And um, it sometimes makes sense that, well, you're not going to see a lot of uh, hip hop music uh, in China with a political agenda, or maybe let me rephrase that a very overt uh, political message, um, right? Because there's lots of ways, um, like the quote down there mentions at the bottom of the slide and metaphors in different ways to to make your music and to to say things um, without having to say them directly. And you see a lot of uh, comments uh, from like, there's a BBC article that they talked about uh, one hip hop group not um, challenging political authority. And, and there is a, over a decade ago, an article in, in New York Times that talks about um, uh, the uh, um, essentially just these criticisms are using Western lens to look at Chinese hip hop. And I think it's an, important to understand um, that uh, it, it, yes, it is, um, uh, in in China and and yes, there's uh, censorship here. Um, but uh, censorship is present in any country, and I think that um, as as teachers and educators, it should be the goal to uh, work towards promoting understanding uh, among our students. Um, that the environment which China uh, exists in, or Korea, or given anywhere, really operates in, uh, is is not going to be the same all around. But at to that point. Uh, Censorship is everywhere, and, and U.S. has censorship, uh, w whether it's for TV or uh, censorship uh, by uh, the, the record labels. Um, it, there is censorship, and there's um, consistently hip-hop artists who are being uh, pushed away, pushed out of uh, getting no radio time, um, that have uh, great messages and, and have um, things that they want to say that should be heard by uh, the masses, but just unfortunately aren't because of certain people don't want uh, others hearing those messages. So. I don't think it's a specific to China. Sure, there's less uh, tolerance in China for such uh, uh, criticisms and social and political criticisms, but it exists everywhere. And um, I think that helping students understand that it exists 
here in the U.S. and exists in China. I mean, it's a little bit different, but um, censorship is not just only about outside control, but it's also important for students to know that self-censorship is something that's uh, powerful and is that um, potentially an even a more uh, deb a debatable and, and talk uh, a topic that of discussion that uh, is really something that uh, every artist uh, probably uses and, and employs, um, but you see a lot uh, in, in China here. And I think this quote says says it great. This is a quote by a socially conscious hip hop group in Beijing um, uh, that when talking about censorship and, and talking about this topic, uh, they mentioned this and said that we have to get more creative with our word choice and find ways to express ourselves because at the end of the day, we need to get our point across. And um, I should probably just take a quick uh, breath there. I'm sorry. Uh, and I'd like to just see if there's anybody that wants to uh, put something in the chat, um, maybe open the floor just to, uh, if you want to type in your definition of, of censorship or uh, just really anything that's came to your mind uh, during this second part of the presentation. So go ahead and take a moment to send something in the chat. And additionally, while people are um, talking or, or putting in their definition of censorship, I think something that's interesting that I saw commented um, in an article was the question of kind of challenging this lack of political or social critique on Chinese hip hop artists with the notion of, so would you release a song that, although gives an account of your true feelings toward a specific issue, could potentially get you in trouble with the government, could get your music pulled from all streaming services, all your social media accounts locked, uh, leave you with no future career, no money, um, or even worse could could happen. Um, I think at the end of the day, it, specifically here, we're talking about Chinese hip hop, um, people need to survive. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big country. And I think that um, just helping students understand to look at Chinese hip hop in the context that it's in, in China, helps a lot. Great. So I think uh, somebody's put an article, LA Times. Great. Was, um, it, did anybody want to put in there uh, what they think censorship is or what they believe censorship is in the chat? I'd be happy to read those out. Yeah, great. So somebody said, I think safety is important to understand censorship as well as making a living. So I have to follow rules. Great. Um, there's a question. Is there a big difference between Taiwan and China hip hop? Uh, is there a big difference? I think that's a big question. <laughs> that's that's a big question. Uh, I don't um, I have a direct answer to that, but uh, I think um, that's something that we could talk about in in the Q and A. Uh, somebody else said protection from potential or real harm. That's a, that's a great comment. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, topic here: um, authenticity. Um, I would define authenticity as uh, just staying true to what you believe in. And I, I think a lot of times, not I think, there is a lot of criticism that scholars, Western scholars specifically, will give to uh, Chinese hip hop and saying that it's inauthentic. Uh, and I think one thing that uh, we have to be careful about when bringing up these topics and debates in classrooms is what is authenticity? How is that defined? like dictionary definition, or are you defining it based on um, uh, what it's the definition in hip hop? Okay, now also, are you defining it based on how um, it's it's uh, been picked up this term and then been used uh, by uh, people to create a mold of a specific type of hip hop artist? Um, and when dealing with with uh, authenticity, um, I, I mean, it's a it's a big issue of uh, just defining this term, and I think um, this is a, a great opportunity to ask students uh, and to and to figure out what their definition of authenticity is. Because um, if uh, you're being authentic to yourself and what you believe in and putting out music, um, can that be? deemed inauthentic and you see uh, a big uh, 
media labels and you see a lot of uh, uh, people who are creating this mode of one definition of authenticity and and specifically you see in like hip-hop in the 80s and 90s um, certain types of molds being created and people uh, taking on personas uh, since the very beginning that may not be um, what they truly believe in but are um, uh, have a great uh, monetary uh, benefit from and you see the same thing in China um, in, in Chinese hip-hop um, and um, I like to share here I have a quotation from one of my students uh, who mentioned last year when we were commenting on readings, we looked at that critique Chinese hip hop for its lack of explicit commentary, and so therefore being inauthentic. Um, and I asked if such critiques like looking at Chinese hip hop through the lens of politically charged hip hop groups like public and um, and uh, this is what they said. They said that we are basically at a point where anyone who is making hip hop is just imitating someone else. So a lot of the criticism of Chinese youth not practicing authentic hip hop because they do not understand the American translations they are making or because they are not making a political statement with their music misses the point. And I think this is a great point, which there's no one definition of an authentic hip hop artist or authentic MC. Right? Hip hop lyr lyricists in the past and now they're storytellers, narrators, they're reporters. It's some a lot of times first person or third person. It 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 really um, is about what they see, right? And and like uh, Fife Dog says, um, you know, we wrap up what we see, meaning reality. And I think that's it's super important to understand China and to Chinese hip hop and to realize that sometimes the realities that they're seeing are harsh ones, uh, and and they come from uh, specific uh, environments that they have stories to tell. And and in China. Um, you know, there's also another scene, just like there is here in the U.S. It doesn't always have to be about one specific topic, and it could be about social justice, or it could be about partying. And I don't know if it's right to say because they're talking about one thing or not makes them inauthentic. I think as long as um, we're looking at who the artist is and, and what they're what they're um, uh, what they're talking about, I think it's important to look at Chinese hip hop in the eyes of China, uh, the context that they live in, um, but then also too to realize that them Chinese hip hop artists doing hip hop in general, um, it means something specifically pre 2017, very authentic. I mean, they're doing something that no one else is doing and is not in the mainstream and is being uh, pushed away from uh, and and being censored. So um, I, I think authenticity is another topic that uh, it's it needs to be talked about uh, more. Um, and um, there's certain artists that have uh, content that is very powerful, um, but may just be fitting into a mold and not specific to that person's own personal story. And I think we need to talk more about authenticity, especially in, in Chinese uh, hip hop. And the last topic here is localization. This is arguably the most research area in East Asian hip hop. You see it in China and in and, and Japan and in Korea. And um, I think it's important to look at localization, not only as localization, but also as scholars have talked about for decades, globalization. So looking at how, and specifically here, Chinese hip hop artists have took in uh, Black American hip hop or Korean hip hop, global hip hop in their community and in, in their lives, and then also but also given it uh, their own uh, take, their own language, their own uh, cultural uh, customs or, or, or ceremonies and different specific things. So it's, in this instance, globalization. You have both, uh, both ways. It goes both ways. It's influence from the outside and also giving back uh, to global hip hop and then in turn giving back then to, to hip hop in the United States. And um in China, specifically, you see artists that are using dialect to enhance their identity, but at the same time, they're also using uh, African American English um, in their music and in their uh, speech, in interviews, and and at concerts uh, live. Um, and so, hip hop is taken influence from so many different things, both local, national, uh, global, um, and also from different uh, genres. You see uh, Chinese hip hop artists uh, and and just hip hop in general. Uh, fusing together different types of, of genres of music uh, together um, and really just giving back. And it's this um, really nice fuse of uh, local, national, and uh, global that you see in China here uh, and you see in other East Asian countries. Sorry, I'm missing these. Um... 
Okay, so somebody said in the, in the comments, artists can't help having a message. They will find workarounds. Look at the arts in the former Soviet Union. Nice. Where does cultural appropriation enter the discussion? Uh, great. Um, there's a lot of um, appropriation topics. Like I said here, we're just discussing uh, censorship, um, authenticity, and localization. But yeah, I mean, uh, appropriation. Okay, if you talk about that, you have to talk about appreciation. Um, there's also a lot of topics about identity. Um, and uh, th there's so many different topics that, that we can discuss here. I think um, the, uh, cultural appropriation, I mean, that's a huge topic uh, that unfortunately we can't get to today, um, but it's something that is definitely in the writings and being discussed in regards to Chinese hip hop. Um, there's another one, the idea of ghost writing or MCs not actually writing their lyrics was once challenged. Iggy Azalea attacked for that. Uh, if you look at some of the French hip hop, the rhythm is different and the topics are more local. Another comment is our another, Sorry, question, are China's minority cultures producing much hip hop? That's another great question as well. Uh, and also too, are they producing a lot of hip hop? Are they producing it in their own language or, or dialect? Um, or are they uh, using the uh, standard Chinese Mandarin uh, uh, language to reach the masses, right? I think there's that these are great comments and there's lots of things that uh, we can discuss more um, uh, later today. Uh, and uh, I think, yeah, that's that's a great point about the minority cultures. Yeah, so lots of great uh, topics here in discussions. I just want to end my presentation because I'm going over time here as um, from uh, Tai Bing, uh, what he said uh, about hip hop is like a big tree. Every artist is a branch and each song is a fruit. Some grow first, some grow later and new branches and new fruits need to grow continuously for the tree to be lush. I think whether it is a variety show or an underground performance, as long as it can convey real, sincere music, this tree will continue to grow. And I just want to um, thank you, everybody, for listening here. I also want to thank the many people who I've come into contact with who have helped me to understand uh, just the hip hop in general uh, and also uh, East Asian hip hop. Uh, people like David B., a big thank you to MC Timbudong, uh, Showtime, uh, Kai for conversations about Chinese hip hop and, and hip hop in general. And um, just uh, please forgive me if I didn't mention your name, um, but um, I appreciate all the advice and knowledge uh, that you bestowed upon me, and I'm very happy to, to be here today, and thank you all uh, for listening. Thank you. I'm going to quickly go into um, a uh, our next uh, session, session two. Uh, which is a uh, relatively uh, short session. Um, it's pre-recorded uh, by James Van Gilder, and it's about how East Asian pop culture has influenced Black American hip hop and and then global hip hop. So we'll go ahead and listen to that. Again, this is a relatively short presentation here, about five minutes. So we'll go ahead and tune in for this. Hello, my name is James Van Gilder, and this is my presentation on East Asia's influence on American hip hop. The goal of this presentation is to shed some light upon an unsung and often underappreciated global cultural connection, and that is the connection between East Asian pop culture and American hip hop. Now, as I'm sure Brendan Dowling has explained, hip hop is more than just rap music. Hip hop is a fully encapsulating culture that can be expressed via music, clothing, visual style, values, and lexicon by both artists and appreciators worldwide. And as with any global cultural export, there are critics as to who can and cannot legitimately use this piece of culture. The cultural exchange, however, between Black American hip hop artists and East Asian culture has been there since the very beginning days of hip hop. And an increasing number of Americans are today using East Asian culture and, and engaging in it through hip hop. Now you may be wondering how this relationship between two seemingly incongruent global cultures began. East Asian, especially Chinese cinema, made its way into underserved communities in New York via theaters such as the Deuce on 42nd, which began showing these films at a reduced cost. This reduced cost allowed people who maybe had never seen foreign film, or really film at all, uh, to enjoy theater in a way that they hadn't been able to previously. Minority groups, especially black Americans, also had very little reason to relate to or watch Hollywood films that had been traditionally made by white Californian men who maybe didn't represent the issues or the interests of these groups. One of the most 
Obvious and open examples of East Asia's influence on American hip hop is in the naming convention of artists from the very beginning. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, for example, are the first hip hop group to ever be founded. And they clearly got their name from the naming conventions of East Asian, especially Chinese Kung Fu films. The same can be said about 1990s rap group Wu-Tang Clan, which is considered one of the most influential groups to this day. Now, Wu-Tang Clan got their name from the Shaolin Wudong style of Kung Fu movies that they love to watch, and there will be more on that later. Another artist, maybe more contemporary, Kendrick Lamar, also known as Kung Fu Kenny, pays homage to the quick and deliberate styles of the Kung Fu films that uh, he so adored as a child by naming himself Kung Fu Kenny. Um, again, a reference to his uh, how he views his own skills as being meticulous, quick, and uh, the level of a master. RZA, one of the founding members of Wu-Tang Clan, has cited East Asian, especially Chinese cinema, as having been one of his biggest influences as a child. Um, and Dr. Joseph Schloss of Princeton has cited these movies as well as having given black Americans uh, film icons to look up to in ways that uh, American cinema maybe would fail to. In addition to sampling sounds from East Asian movies, American hip-hop artists have catapulted their songs to top charts uh, by using East Asian instrumentation, such as Jay-Z's Big Pimpin' and 50 Cent's Candy Shop, which use instruments such as the Arhu or the Dizu, which is a Chinese flute. In addition to both the naming convention and the sounds of East Asia, American hip-hop artists have been known to borrow the visual style as well. Artists such as Lupe Fiasco, Soulja Boy, Young Thug, and Denzel Curry have been known to both wear and promote East Asian clothing in their songs, such as Bape and Maharashi. American hip-hop artists have been known to incorporate themes from East Asia in their music videos, in their art, and in their dancing, as you can see in many of these examples. The secondary goal of this presentation was to legitimize East Asian hip-hop as a culture. East Asia has a long history of spoken word music, competitive poetry, street art, and many other facets of hip-hop that we use today. Hip-hop culture additionally has adopted and borrowed from East Asian culture since its very inception, and today still uses its values of honor, interpersonal practices, and social independence. Thank you for watching my presentation today on East Asian culture and its influence on American hip-hop. Hello, my name is James Van Gilder, and this is my presentation. Okay, thanks, James. Uh, so session three, um, this is the session description here. Um, I, this is our... Um, he notes for today, uh, Jamel Mims, who is an African-American rapper, multimedia artist, uh, revolutionary. He's based in New York City. Um, he's also known uh, in China as MC Ting uh, And his work concerns the historical and contemporary cultural connections between Black America and China, social movements, memory, and augmented and virtual hyper-reality. Um, he received his Bachelor of Arts in Sociology at Boston College and studied at the University of Business and Economics in Beijing. After graduating, he received a Fulbright scholarship to pursue an independent study about hip hop in China uh, during China's uh, golden age of hip hop. Um, and he was also an artist in residence, uh, most recently at Found Sound China, uh, which is a music diplomacy residency that brought American and Chinese producers together for a collaborative tour. Um, he also uh, studied uh, Chinese as um, a freshman at Sidwell Friends School in Washington, DC. Um, and uh, as MC Tim Budong, he has performed extensively across the U.S. and China, uh, including South by Southwest Music Festival, China We LA, U.S. based Analyx like Chengdu, Modern Sky uh, Music Festival. And his work has been pretty much uh, everywhere, uh, Telematic Gallery, Wall Place, Macmillan Gallery in New York City, um, but also featured in uh, IAD Magazine, Variety, Vice, The Nation, Radii, China, NBC, CBC, you name it, and he's been there. Um, and he is currently... Uh, senior fellow at USC Annenberg's Innovation Lab, and I am. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have you here uh, today, uh, I, and it's 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 an honor. And I uh, hope everybody here um, has their notepads ready and uh, pens and pencils and erasers, um, and get ready to uh, take a lot of notes uh, and be uh, engaged uh, beyond your expectations. So let's introduce Mr. Jamel Mims. Wow, super. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully I live up to that very storied introduction. You know, huge shout out to uh, Brendan, Professor Dowling, uh, and 
uh, all the folks who put this conference together. I think it's so important that, you know, social studies teachers, you know, as an educator, that social studies teachers uh, and language teachers are getting together to really think about and really engage with, you know, uh, China, which, you know, this is the country that's shaping the future of the world right now. You know, whether you're talking about in technology, in culture, you know, uh, the world is going to be paying attention to. Uh, and many of your students are going to be growing up in a world where they'll have to, uh, you know, confront, deal with, engage, negotiate, uh, do business with, have cultural relations with in one shape, form or another with China. Um, and so um, as educators and as teachers, I'm, you know, I, I'm, you know, Humbled to be here in your presence to deliver some lessons that I've learned as an artist and as an educator. Uh, uh, so here, let me do the Zoom thing and share my screen. Uh, here, everybody see that? All right, and I am going to go here. You uh, may see the top and bottom tab uh, of my screen, but I think. So long as you guys can see it there, you should be okay. All right. Great, so let's rock and roll. And I always like to start off with an introduction like this. Might have a cypher with Cornell, LaCall, Janelle, LaJa, Dinna, chillin'. Ain't nobody seen a kid like this. Who we think he is? Some super villain rebel demeanor. What do you mean by revolution anyway? Asiatic kid and play, uptown chilling, samurai top knot, order off menu at your hood, Chinese spot, xiong. Might have to spit a bar, Mandarin, what the gummers at Beijing, Yijing, Rin, Shi, what the Ling Hun, Shuo the Tai Biao Jun, Guo la Hao Ji Ge Beijing, Wang Shang Zai Sally Tun. What a Kai Xin, yes, I do this just for fun. Will a girl mean for the revolution? When the adrenaline kicks in, I transform into an animal, Bian Chung. So, uh, as Brendan said, my name is Jamel Mims, aka MC Ting uh, and I'm a Black bilingual multimedia artist and rapper, uh, educator, uh, and you know, focusing on building and bridging the connections between Black America and China. Uh, this we're gonna do like a quick talk here. This is like a a, a three part talk. Um, we're really we're gonna talk some uh, again about lessons from uh, my experience as an artist. I, and, and learning uh, Chinese hip hop, uh, sorry, learning Mandarin and, and getting to engage with the Chinese hip hop community. Uh, talking to them about, you know, being an educator in New York City using culturally responsive pedagogy and the power of hip hop in social studies classrooms, right? Uh, and then I think in part three, we'll really like leave with, well, what's the question, you know, given the implications for Chinese hip hop, just what are the implications for your students in this world of, you know, Chinese spy balloons, TikTok, anti-Asian hatred, what is actually all that, you know, what does all that mean? And what, what are the actually implications for the role that hip hop can play uh, in a, an increasingly globalized world, but also in a world that's, you know, increasingly full of problems that we actually have to, have to come together to solve. Uh, so I'll start. Get down, get down, get down, can everybody get hear down, that? Down, get down, everybody rise up. It's MC Ting Wudong and Gan Mana. Um, I'm originally an artist from Washington, D.C., uh, based in Harlem. I'm a multimedia artist, a bilingual rapper, who raps in English and Mandarin Chinese. My work is about bringing forward a whole new internationalist world and way of being where it's not weird for a Black dude to rap in Chinese. I started studying Chinese in high school. I've been a lifelong fan of hip hop. Uh, I was a study abroad student. I got invited to participate in doing a documentary on the hip hop scene there for a show called Sexy Beijing and an episode called Bling Bling in Beijing. And so this was like the first introduction for a lot of Westerners to like hip hop, the homegrown hip hop scene that was in China. So Sufei called me up and I said, of course, I come all the way from Washington DC, Chocolate City, just to come check out Beijing and see if the hip hop is really real or really not so real. The year after that, I applied for a Fulbright grant to really develop this study of hip hop in Beijing and, uh, you know, really embedded myself with a network of like rappers, DJs, graffiti writers, skaters uh, over the course of a year. And I found a lot of solace within the hip hop community there. You know, you belong to like a culture. You go out and go break dancing together. You go out and go rap together. You know, they're challenging me and challenging them. They're saying like, you know, stop rapping in English. We know you can rap in English. Oh, rap in Chinese, what's up? Plus we can't understand it. Um, there was a real community around that. And it was, you know, uh, 
Section six, hip hop cipher. So I'm, I'm gonna pause right there before we go any further, all right? Uh, and talk a little bit about the power of like that rap name, right? So my rap name, MC Ting Budong, um, as I begin to get into, I had been studying, uh, had been studying Mandarin all throughout high school uh, and finally got the opportunity to engage in 2006 as part of a study abroad program with the hip hop community in China. Um, and that's really where I earned that name, MC Ting Budong, which, which means ironically, I uh, don't understand. I'll tell you the specific story about how that happened. But first, I want you guys to throw in the chat, what is your MC name, right? What is that thing that people call you, that thing that you have inside yourself that others recognize? You know, that can be something that you're passionate about, something that you're close to, a nickname. Um, but I think there's real power in those MC names and the way that we design ourselves. So I'll give folks a second to just throw in, what's your MC name? And I want to, I want you to shout, I'm going to shout you out in the chat. So who do we got? Oh, we got MC Ming Dynasty. Okay, what up, Lori? MC Ming Dynasty. That's that's kind of fire, actually. <laughs> MC Herzy B. Herzy B. And if you can, you know, I love that, you know, a student gave me this nickname five years ago and it stuck. You know, I think there's so much. A, a student told me, hey, man, you should be rapping. And that's why I started, actually. And so I think there's so much that our students actually see in us uh, that we carry forward. What are some other MC names that folks have? Concepts of an artist, a poet, a thinker. All right, shout out to MC Gary out here being an artist, a poet, a thinker. I mean, all this is super, super important, both in how we see ourselves and really in thinking from the perspective of how your students are seeing themselves. All right, here, I'll go forward for a second. MC Traveling Mama. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Look, it's, it's also things that we do, right? You know, they can be, uh, you know, I think a, a great thing about uh, the tradition of of like naming and naming conventions in hip hop have to do with paying homage to others, right? They can be, you know, ironic as well. They can be tongue in cheek references to things that we appreciate, you know, or that we want others to appreciate about us. All right. MC Mama Kate. MC Chiguai. Yes, let's go. Because I'm a little strange into it. And see Chi Guai. That's you, you. These are fire rap names. Some people might need to carry this out going forward from the conference. All right, all right. But I'll share a little story about how I earned my uh, MC name. So I uh, began studying Chinese in high school, and you know, shout out if anybody knows this movie. Uh, I know uh, Brendan was going down a litany of lists of of uh, uh, and and the last presenter James was giving a litany of lists of of. Uh, uh, Chinese cinema and its influence in in a uh, Black American culture, but this one was hugely influential to me. This is a uh, uh, a movie called Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon, right? Uh, and you know, yes, the same like music producer Barry Gordy. Uh, and this this kung fu film showed. You know, uh, I used to watch it on reruns. It was actually a little bit before my time, but it showed you know, a blended culture of like music and youth culture with these culturally fluid characters. You had like a trio of like uh, of like Chinese, like breakdancing MCs that would kind of introduce different scenes. You had Bruce Leroy, the, you know, versus Shonuff, the Shogun of Harlem, uh, you know, uh, using uh, Kung Fu, you know, in this kind of setting. And I, you know, so I would always kind of like remember this and, and think back uh, of this movie and, uh, as like a real source of kind of inspiration. Um, but I started, you know, as was said, started learning Chinese in high school, uh, at Sidwell Friends School, you know, movies like this and, you know, Rush Hour, Rumble in the Bronx, Romeo Must Die. It was kind of like that era, uh, when you talked about Black and Asian solidarity. Uh, and when I first started studying the language and, and frankly started kind of being, fam becoming familiarized with Chinese culture, it was really heavily reliant on rote memorization you know, and an immediate language and a framework that was designed around like business and commercial interests, really viewing China as like a potential partner and and after Deng Xiaoping's like, you know, opening of China, right? Uh, and so we didn't really learn Chinese or about Chinese culture through like ancient Chinese culture, not through poetry or song, not through like the Song or Tang dynasties, you know, or Ming dynasties, right? But really learned about it through like, you know, commerce, rote memorization, listening and writing. Um, and so our, our listening and writing was very, was very good. But as far as like speaking and actually relating to people, you know, going to downtown to a restaurant to order food, 
th that was not something that I could do for like the first eight years of studying this language. Um, and so yeah, another thing that was a part of this experience was that it was, all, you know, like all of my formal education in the United States, it also took place, you know, in a racialized context, right, where I was a young black kid coming from Southeast Washington, D.C., uh, uh, relatively like kind of impoverished section of Washington, D.C., going to the more affluent section of Washington, D.C. to go uh, study Mandarin. Uh, and, you know, I remember it, having academic advisors that say, well, are you sure you want to take this really difficult language here? You're already transitioning into this environment, you know, from the best of their viewpoint, looking out for me, uh, but totally operating within this racialized context that actually couldn't see potential or that obscured potential. Um, and we'll get back to this as a, as, a, as a kind of constant theme and also a note to think about as we were educating and thinking about the world of our students and the, the kind of racialized container that they're actually growing up and learning in, right? So I kept asking my teachers this question, yo, where's the hip hop? Where's the hip hop? Where's the hip hop? Uh, and they referred me to, you know, folks, uh, some of them was that Brennan actually shouted out, uh, you know, but early on uh, re referred me to folks like uh, Jay Cho and Eason, Eason Chan. Um, and I remember, you know, going to Chinatown and finding CDs, you know, for folks like that. Uh, but it really wasn't until uh, I got uh, to go on a study abroad trip in 2006 uh, to connect uh, with the folks who were shooting that program, uh, Sexy Beijing, Bling Bling in Beijing, uh, that I actually got an answer. And so, uh, you know, I, I kept asking the question, though, you know, where's the hip hop? Where's the hip hop? Where's the hip hop? Uh, I had a photography professor that connected me to a, a journalist that he had brought into the classroom whose partner was shooting that episode. So it was like, you know, my friend has a friend, has a friend, has a friend. Um, but it was all from continuing to ask this question of where's the hip hop, where's the hip hop, where's the hip hop? And I find myself in that section six cipher, uh, 2006, 2007, I'm wearing this shirt that there's an image of that says, you know, on the front it has the characters for Ting Budong, which means I don't understand. Uh, and I brought it ironically as like a, a tourist gift because uh, you know, in China, folks were always just as being a black person in China were at that time were immediately fascinated and kind of always coming up to you and asking, oh, you know, or saying things uh, that I thought they thought I probably couldn't understand. Uh, but many times I would turn around and say like, you know, oh, hey, actually, I heard what you said or hey, actually, I understand what, what you're saying. Um, and so I brought this shirt as a gag on that. Uh, and so I find myself wearing this T-shirt up on stage in, you know, uh, at, at a cypher. Uh, one of the rap battles that uh, Brendan referred to, you know, similar to the Iron Mike uh, that was taking place in Beijing. Um, and I'm on stage and I'm, you know, you know, as I had been asking the question of where is the hip hop, you know, over the past eight years of studying Chinese. And suddenly the folks with the answer were handing me the mic, you know. So I grabbed the mic and I, you know, I'm on stage. And I'm, you know, start rapping in English, start freestyling in Mandarin, and folks' eyes start to bug out. They see the shirt that says Ting Budong. They go, hey, what's up? Ta the Tishu Shan, the Shu Ta Ting Budong, that's that Jenna Lung Ting Dong, Tao Chi Lai, MC Ting Budong. Yo, his shirt says he can't understand, but yo, he really spits that. Yo, let's go, MC Ting Budong. Uh, and it was from there that the moniker of MC Ting Budong, you know, took it up and it really stuck. Um, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself, actually. Um, because this was actually a, you know, this is the, the, a year after that, I applied for Fulbright uh, and, you know, to study hip hop in China. And that was like, you know, basically taking that night and extending it over the course of the year uh, in order to really dig in and investigate, you know, um, because that video, Bling Bling in Beijing, actually did very well and went viral on the early days of YouTube. Uh, and I uh, and it opened a lot of Westerners' idea, eyes to the idea that oh, there's like homegrown hip hop actually happening in Beijing. Um, and so from then, I got it. Uh, I applied for the Fulbright. You know, got notification that I was accepting it the summer before I was going to go to it. I'm at a party with my you know uh, girlfriend, current partner, uh, and the you know we have our family together with my daughter Lotus. Um, we, I'm there at a party and I'll, I'll, I'll date myself here to let you know that the DJ at this party for like a streetwear party at that time was Kid Cudi, right? Uh, so this was some years ago, you just was casual, casually DJing. And we're 
we're there at this party. Um, and suddenly the police show up. They start dragging everybody out. We're in, you know, in the middle of the street there, you know, they kind of drag me into the middle of the street. I'm thinking the whole time, like, you know, these guys don't know who they're messing with. I'm, I basically work for the state department. I've got like federal clearances that, you know, the Fulbright commission has my back, you know, they drag me out into the street, you know, uh, start hitting me in the chest, in the stomach. You know, uh, I have a friend who's a photographer. He's taking pictures. I'm, I'm also a photographer that, at that time. He's taking pictures of what's happening to myself and other people. They grab him. They grab basically anyone with a camera, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, this is happening in, in, in Boston, in, you know, in the, in the wee hours of night in downtown Boston. You know, basically we were someplace that we shouldn't have been. Um, and I'm thinking the entire time these, the, you know, these guys don't know what's coming towards them. The State Department is going to, you know, be up here so fast tomorrow. The next day, I get a call from the State Department, and I'm ready to go off. And they're like, whoa, 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 we heard you got into some trouble with the law. So actually, your Fulbright's going to be in jeopardy until you come down here and explain this to us. Um, and so this is a real wake-up for, call for me about, again, a real reminder of that racialized nature in which I learned the language and that, like, even if you ignored it, it would come back for you. Um, and then it also was a real reminder of like that this thing was systemic, that it it wasn't a, a thing of, you know, police over here or, you know, uh, well-meaning, you know, uh, but ultimately misguided educators over here. This was a system that it actually was, that it was actually all a part of. Um, and so this was a real wake up call for me um, uh, about, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, from that. And would later go on to really like inspire decisions I would make uh, later on. Um, now I ultimately did get to go on that trip, and ultimately did you know, uh, you know, get to really become you know MC Ting Budong and go on the misadventures of MC Ting Budong uh, and really engage with that initial first era of hip hop um, in China. And so you know, and these are some of the like pictures and, and photos from it. Um, uh, the, you know, on the left here, you have a picture of a rap battle um, that was taking place at Tango Nightclub. This was part of like the Iron Mike series that Brendan was mentioning. Uh, and these were like, this was the scene. It was like eight mile, you know, every night, every, every, you know, two nights or so, you'd be able to catch a, a live rap battle kind of like this. Um, uh, on the right, you have uh, uh, Jiao Wei and Jieza, who are part of the seminal hip hop group, uh, In Sar. Uh, uh, and, you know, recording at their studio at home, you know, I basically, you know, over the course of that year lived with Jawe, uh, and so got like a real up close and personal view and vibe of like what it was like, you know, as an MC in this era, um, down in the left corner, you have the forbidden city break, uh, for forbidden city breakers, uh, which is like a, a breaking crew around this area as well, you know, uh, break dancing at, the, at that time was more popular than I think any of the other elements of hip hop where it, it you, I mean, you had, uh, you know, if you're familiar with like the Chinese tradition of like square dancing, not like yeehaw square dancing, but like dancing in a giant public square together with like fans and synchronized movements. Uh, there were like grandmas and aunties like doing that for hip hop in China uh, at that time. So it was immensely popular. Um, but break dancing also similar and subject to the same kind of influences from Korea where you had some of the top B-boys in the world were actually coming out of Korea. Uh, and, you know, they would spend time in China or perform in China or host these kinds of competitions. Um, and so there was a lot of regional influence from, from Korea and influence from Korean breakdancing as well. Uh, and then graffiti, you know, uh, and really getting to understand like, okay, what, what are the rhythms of graffiti that are taking place in the urban sprawl that is post-Olympics Beijing, um, you know, where uh, you have different, uh, graffiti crews, but then also it being a real social commentary. And I think perhaps the sharpest edge of social commentary amongst, you know, hip hop culture um, at that time was among graffiti, especially aimed at like gentrification and the movement of, you know, peoples who were in places like the Hutongs in Beijing or uh, making a commentary on migrant populations. And so um, this is an era that it really felt like almost time traveling back to like uh to like the early days of hip hop, you know, that I had dreamed about going to or visiting like, you know, in the Bronx or uh uh in the early days of hip hop. Um and so um yeah, this was a real kind of uh uh seminal informative time 
uh, and how I earned uh, my rap name. And uh, zooming the lens back, this was actually taking place in the context of the golden age of hip hop in, in China, uh, which is, uh, again, just marked by the, the Iron Mike and these constant kind of rap battles. Uh, down here in the corner, you have an image of Daco CDs, which is another way that lots of hip hop music originally got to the Chinese mainland were through these side CDs that you would you would you would see how there's a little hole punched at the at the end of it where they would punch a little hole out at the end of it or at the side of it. Uh, and these are basically like dead stock CDs uh, that they would you know punch a hole in to really de devalue and then mass export you know, into places like China and Taiwan, uh, you know, other uh, countries in Asia. Um, uh, and essentially Chinese, you know, young people, youth would go going through these troves of what was essentially considered trash and garbage, right? Of CDs will go through these, you know, troves of, of CDs to go and find and discover like music. And uh, this is in the days before the internet, right? Um, uh, a great resource for this is a two-part series from Radii China on the history of rap in China. Uh, 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 yeah, that really goes into, you know, it's, it's by Xu Hong Fan. She's, you know, uh, amazing. And I don't think there's been coverage like this around, like looking at hip hop as a movement in China. Uh, uh, but I would definitely refer any educators, or anybody here to check out this article and I'll, you know, drop, I mean, I'll drop links in the slideshow and stuff like that, resource to all of that. But this is definitely one I wanted to pull up and highlight uh, as a part of that. Uh, but some other key figures from that era, as uh, as was mentioned in the previous presentation, MC Weber, Wang Bo, um, uh, was considered like you know the kind of you know rock him or or you know the kind of god MC, goat MC in China, one of the originals and greats, uh, you know of Mandarin language, you know Beijing, Beijing Kua, uh, of rap. Um, and this was, you know, other things that characterize it were this is before there was any real commercial industry. There was lots of energy around it, and it was really viewed as a subculture. But there was really no commercial industry, no, you know, kind of recording industry attached to it, uh, you know. And so these, you would have folks that were the most popular rappers in the country, but then like owned a pet shop during the day, you know, and like raised turtles, you know. And so it's, um, this is. Uh, Oh, great. It's available in the curriculum guide. But um, yeah, you had a lot of folks dealing with this question, you know, that was uh, brought up earlier as well around authenticity, whether or not their works would, uh, uh, w whether or not they would conform their lyrics or their works or write them, you know, so that they could pass the cultural board, um, whether or not they themselves were aligned more towards the more conscious uh, hip hop or more commercial hip hop. Uh, you know, a lot of the same considerations that American artists were making and doing at the same time, right? Um, um, so some real lessons from that first part uh, for me, and I think to, to drop on it was around like learning Chinese in the classroom being greatly accelerated and deepened by that relationship to hip hop culture. Uh, that that was really what would you know, you know, thinking of myself as a student and putting myself in the shoe, you know, uh, of, in the shoes of your students, that that culture really anchoring my experience. And I think, you know, a question I would have is like, for, you know, for educators would really be like, what youth popular cultures or subcultures might anchor the experience of your students? You know, uh, the language learning experience, again, being really embedded and occurring in a racialized context that Again, even if you ignore that larger context, that larger context is not ignoring you, you know. Uh, and so how do you acknowledge and deal with those real structural realities? You know, how as an educator are you preparing your students to be able to address and to deal with those structural realities as opposed to, you know, ignore them or put them to the side, right? Um, and, uh, and I think there's also a real question around or a real thing around pursuing those, uh, you know, initial kind of questions that that initial kind of spark or curiosity. I mean, you all are dealing with and working with young people who have that kind of curiosity who are in classrooms. You, you know, if you're a social studies teacher and you're specializing in East Asian history, these are not most of the social studies students that are taking place in, you know, social studies classes or students uh, that are, um, you know, in the United States right now. 
And so, you know, just who knows what questions they'll continue to pursue and what answers, you know, and connections they'll make in pursuing those answers. And so, you know, um, as you know, I think at the time, even in asking the question of where's the hip hop, it might have even seemed somewhat frivolous to my Chinese teacher, but she didn't shut me down. And that actually opened up a whole pathway that allowed me to become who I am today. Um, and so, um, um, so after uh, all of that um, and going on the Fulbright and coming back, suddenly it was, you know, I'm in New York and figuring out, okay, well, what do we do now? Um, and a, a, a large part of what I uh, ended up doing as a part of New York, of, of, of moving to New York was uh, both working in education, you know, uh, as an educator that was using, you know, hip hop and uh, I used hip hop as a research method as a Fulbright uh, during the Fulbright. And I used, you know, hip hop as a pedagogical tool in my professional life as I became an educator. Um, and it was really my connection to young people in education and thinking about the future that um, that really uh, drove me to uh, to really be an active participant and organizer in anti-police brutality protests, um, especially around the time of uh, uh, Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown. Uh, and before that, uh, I had an opportunity to work with Cornell West and Carl Dix as part of a nonviolent civil disobedience campaign uh, aimed at the stop and frisk policy, precisely the kind of policy that you know had gotten me arrested in Boston and that had threatened my Fulbright. Uh, and, um, and so through this period, that was really a lot of what I was dealing with and thinking about was the relationship of, of state power, uh, to, you know, to art and education, the relationship of state power to the future of young black and brown people. Um, and, you know, was being part of laying the groundwork for the first kind of waves of black lives matter protests in, in New York city. Um, and so, um, um, uh, other things I did during this period was really, really take a deep dive into culturally responsive pedagogy. Again, hip hop really being an anchor in this and uh, was worked for a program called Fresh Prep where we wrote original music and used techniques such as call and response and theater games to really engage students in the classroom. Uh, we were doing this for a standardized test uh, and wrote original music around like social studies and US and global history content, had students listen to that, you know, we play games for them to remember and then have them go and uh, uh, it, this was used as like a test prep course. Uh, we then developed that into like uh, nationally like uh, recognized and in, in, uh, arts education ma uh, management uh, and uh, dissemination that run like a federal grant called the AEMDD grant um, as a model of professional development for teachers uh, around training them to use cultural responsive pedagogy in the classroom. Again, focused around ELA, US and global history. Um, and this was some of the work that I was like really most proud of as an educator, you know, uh, uh, and really digging into cultural responsive, you know, pedagogy, you know, cultural responsive teaching and learning, you know, holding students to, you know, incredibly, you know, holding students to high standards, but then also really looking at teaching to and through their strengths and using culture as a real vehicle to do that. Um, and so uh, some examples of that are that are uh, pertinent to this discussion uh, are two here. One of them is a, uh, uh, so I also, I also was a Mandarin teacher and would do this, use the same kind of strategy as a way to teach Mandarin language. So exploring ways to use hip hop to teach Mandarin language I had students create their own, you know, songs and chants. Uh, we throw on a beat and have students, you know, uh, jump in and, and you know, uh, basically we use that as like assessment for our students. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, just taking kind of the basic, uh, basic chants, basic uh, introductions and like setting them to music, throwing on a beat and having students like uh, create their own original uh, like raps around it. 
uh, from the social studies perspective, uh, because this is an East Asia studies conference, I, had a, I, I did some digging up of a song that I was tapped to, to write on. That was, uh, this is a song that's about like uh, teaching ancient uh, Chinese dynasties. Um, I'm John Morgan. All law right. firms are not the same. This As America's largest personal injury firm, SoundCloud. we have more trials, more lawyers, more office buildings, awesome. and more caring staff members Thank than you, any other injury law firm in the world. There's really nothing else like it. All With right. more than 2 million really people in just like, like you calling us so. every single year, your trust in us means the world to me. There's only one Morgan & Morgan, ForThePeople.com. Visit ForThePeople.com for an office near you. Great. So... In 1200 BC, Rwanda to the Far East Across the Pacific Ocean is where you find my country Dynasties of Shang and Zhou, you ain't even know Made the first books from bamboo, wrote history on bones 221 BC into me, Chen Shu Hongdi At the age of 13, I became the first king Known throughout the land as the Tiger of Qin Study pages from the homie Rich Huang Fates Ugh. They call it legalism, a system of strict rules and harsh punishments I use this as the basis of my new government Conquered army after army after the army in the warmer states period unified the people ain't nobody stopping me standardize the writing the language and the currency lose to me in war assemble my next masterpiece building the great wall of making terracotta army <laughs> So, yeah, so I'll, I'll throw one verse on there. You know, I'll let you guys, I'm not going to listen to the rest of it from you. It's from seven years ago, kind of like does something to me. But I'll let you guys listen to that on your own time. Uh, but just two quick examples of, again, uh, that are pertinent to this group around using cultural responsive pedagogy in the classroom. Uh, and again, work that I was like, after I came back to New York and really uh, saw and used the utility of using hip hop as a research method, thinking about applying it, oh, here, here's how we could actually apply it as like a pedagogical tool. Um, uh, and so, you know, I was training teachers, you know, many like yourselves, but many, uh, frankly, a lot of language, Chinese language teachers uh, around using these types of techniques in the classroom, um, and as well as a lot of like social studies uh, and ELA teachers around that. Um, So while I was going through that, becoming, you know, an educator in schools, you know, culturally responsive educator in schools, using hip hop as a teaching method, sharing insights to the Chinese teaching community about using hip hop in the classroom, uh, and frankly, starting to experiment with my voice and develop as an artist. Those were actually some of the first, you know, songs and media that I was actually like writing, um, as well as like really, you know, uh, taking uh, uh, being part of a vanguard of like activism against the uh, anti-police brutality activism. Uh, I saw that my homies across the ocean were facing a lot of the same, you know, a lot of the same issues, especially when it came to state repression and violence. You know, at the same time, I was being targeted by the NYPD for the role that I played in stopping, you know, the stop and frisk policy in, in New York. My brothers across the ocean were being targeted by the state for lyrics that they had written. Um, and uh, where you had, you know, we're going through parallel experiences. The photo that I showed earlier of Jawe and Jieza, uh, here's them with Jawe, Jieza, and Fact E12, uh, 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 another artist and a group that they uh, uh, formed that has carried over into the modern era of Chinese rap called Purple Soul, uh, that took many of the same like anti disestablishmentarian anti sentiments from the 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 their previous era as Insar and brought it really into the modern era. Uh, Fact E12 himself was arrested and you know put in jail. You have you see Jawe there wearing a t-shirt that says free Fact E12. And you know, a number of artists at that time were being, you know, 
uh, disappeared, jailed, arrested, you know, you grab one, you say, all right, well, tell me the other folks that you're associating with um, so that, you know, and we'll let you go. Um, and what this does is it creates a situation where nobody in the community can trust one another. And it essentially obliterated this first wave of hip hop uh, in China. And so this was, you know, I, I was seeing this happening, you know, in correspondence with my homies while this was happening, you know, uh, throughout 2012, 13, 14, uh, to the, the, the mid like 2010s. Uh, while again, I was facing this, uh, you know, state repression as well. They were seeing what was happening to me, sending me messages of solidarity in the same kind of way. Um, so this was the context in the background before I went uh, back to China uh, almost about a decade later uh, as part of the Found Sound China program, uh, which there on the bottom right corner, you know, you can see some of the artists that we were with that, that joined U.S. and Chinese artists. Um, uh, together for a collaborative tour. Uh, and then the year after I went back and organized like my own kind of nine city tour, uh, really based on stepping out as MC Ting Budong as an artist uh, and really re-engaging with, you know, uh, Chinese hip hop. Now that it was in this modern era, you know, the era of rap of China, of trap music, you know, uh, where hip hop was now extremely popular across China. It was no longer a... a a, you know, uh, an unknown thing to say that you were an MC or a rapper. Folks knew what that was, but they associated it, frankly, with like the uh, uh, the the more bling bling and commercial image, uh, you know, of rap than anything else. Um, and so it was really in this context that I uh, uh, went back to China, and this was during what's now kind of the mainstream era, you know, uh, of you know of Chinese hip hop. Uh, where you know uh, a kind of some key figures around that are, at, you know, as been, as what has been mentioned, the rap of China, uh, extremely popular television show. Think of like American Idol, but for rap, you know, uh, and uh, yeah, modeled after the Korean show Show Me the Money, um, and then uh, uh, n another uh, kind of seminal figure during this period are the Higher Brothers, who are arguably the first, if In Sang were the first like uh, kind of mainstream group around China, you know, where then the Higher Brothers are the first like international hip hop global group where you had folks in the US on Vice like writing about the Higher Brothers, you know, who are these Chinese guys in dreadlocks, you know, uh, doing trap music. Um, and, uh, but they were really responsible for a kind of real global explosion of hip hop in China. And then, um, you also had their label called 88 Rising, uh, which is a uh, a label that really looked at a kind of a diasporic image of China, whether that's from uh, uh, whether that's based in the Chinese mainland and, and top tier cities like Beijing, it's in especially Shanghai and Chengdu. Uh, the Higher Brothers were one of their first kind of signed artists, but then also folks like Rich Brian out of the Philippines. Um, they currently do a festival called Head of the Clouds Festival, which uh, takes place, you know, in New York and in, in California as part of the Coachella Festival. You know, so it's, you know, huge, immensely popular, uh, huge and immensely popular. Um, but 88 Rising, the label, Higher Brothers, Rap of China. Um, and then there's a, an, an, a litany of, of Chinese, you know, MCs in this era, you know, Guy, and, you know, Air, who is a, a, a Uyghur MC who won Rapid China in 2018. Uh, Bohan Phoenix, who is a Chinese American uh, uh, rapper, you know, uh, immigrated from Hubei uh, to uh, to like the Boston area in uh, when he was 12 years old and, you know, came up, in, you know, as part of the New York scene, but a bilingual, you know, rapper and MC. Um, uh, Vava. Uh, and Vanita Wong to, you know, uh, you know, are the probably like most chart topping like uh, uh, MCs who are uh, women right now, Naiwan, but a number of, you know, an, a huge explosion of popularity of, of uh, rap in China. Um, so I think, you know, real lessons from that, you know, from engaging with the modern era of Chinese hip hop is really thinking about those two, you know, eras from the from the you kind of old school, you know, or golden age of hip hop to the modern, you know, or more commercial age of hip hop, 
where you saw it said there was suddenly like a commercial uh industry behind this you suddenly had like record executives you know and managers uh you know and all the structures of uh, that that went along with that um you know i think uh looking at the thread of like the re relationship of state repression you know and what we were both facing you know uh insar uh and myself you know through that period uh is a really helpful way to actually examine and understand you know like frankly you know international relations and hip hop culture in uh in the midst of that and as an interesting case study around like black and asian solidarity when facing state repression from uh you know both places um and you know i, I think th this was a real thing of like uh in this you know on that second part was really uh, myself both becoming an artist in this context and really you know honestly becoming the answer to the question that i answered that i'd been asking so long ago around where's the hip-hop where's the hip-hop where's the hip-hop i mean and being part of its history and being able to like shape its future um uh but yeah those are those are some kind of key learnings or insights from that section um and then lastly with part three isn't so much uh a whole different section but really more of a question of of in this era you know that we're defined in now uh bringing it to the present for a second uh, you know an era that's defined by pandemic and protests you know you know uh uh an environmental crisis that shows us that we're a more interconnected world than ever when you have you know uh smoke from canada being blown into places like new york city um dealing with the social and political effects of a world on lockdown you know the rise of anti-Asian hatred, right? I mean, you have now, this is not, this is a tweet from this year from Elon Musk, you know, arguably the most pop, one of the most powerful people on the planet, you know, uh, again, you know, calling out and, and uh, you know, asking where did COVID come from, asking for a friend, you know, replies saying China, you know, Elon Musk, you know, laughing emojis, but the, the a real effect of like, of anti-Asian violence that, that actually this, and xenophobia that this actually stirs up. Um, and frankly, an environment uh, of racism and the pandemic that that has put, you know, not only black and brown people in the crosshairs, but also, you know, our Asian brothers and sisters in the crosshairs as well. Uh, and so there's this real question of like, well, what is this culture? You know, uh, again, this question around authenticity, right? What is this culture that, you know, has been drawn from, has taken inspiration from, has, you know, been in interconnected with black culture? Uh, what is it going to do now that, you know, in this era that we're seeing, you know, black and brown people being under attack, you know, during, you know, the summer of uh, George Floyd, you know, there was this real question around, like, what is the Chinese hip hop community going to do, you know, around Black Lives Matter, right? Um, I think you had a similar question, you know, right after in 2021, you had the whole, uh, whole movement around anti-Asian hatred and, uh, you know, in response to a spate of hateful attacks, including the you know, uh, Atlanta spa massacre, but what are, what is the black community going to do, you know, uh, for, you know, uh, Asians who are being subject to racism and violence, much in the same way that black and brown people are. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is a real question about like going forward for the future of Chinese hip hop. What's the, what's the actual future of Chinese hip hop going to, you know, what questions are they going to engage with and, and deal with, uh, especially now that we're in a increasingly globalized, you know, internet connected world where we're sharing the same culture real time. And, and frankly, a lot of the same issues and dealings with uh, uh, state power and re and repressive, you know, uh, structures of the state. Um, so just to break down some of these images are like, uh, uh, you know, folks holding signs from the recent protests around anti-Asian hatred, hate is a virus, um, and, you know, as well as, you know, larger unions being part of that. Um, uh, uh, up on the left is a, an artist rendering of like a, a panel discussion that I did with uh, an artist I mentioned earlier, Bohan Phoenix, around this particular issue in general. Uh, Chinese rappers chasing clout through hip hop culture. Why don't they do more for Black Lives Matter? That was a follow-up to a Variety article that we were both uh, featured in by Josh Fayola. Um, that was really, again, around this kind of question. Um, and some of the work that I've been doing in this period has really been on, particularly around this question of like uh, 
Black and Asian solidarity, you know, the connections between Black America and China, you know, uh, and then what the what those implications, you know, and then what are the implications for that in this increasingly globalized world? And so uh, being part of the Bandung Residency, which is a connection uh, between Asian American Arts Alliance and uh, the um, uh, Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora, uh, uh, organizing with Alan Z and Jason Chu, the Chinatown tour, uh, which is we really looked at going to different cities that have Chinatowns uh, and really looking at, you know, uh, uh, like how are we using like art to revitalize, you know, those cities as radical centers of culture after the coronavirus pandemic, um, connecting with the African-American China Leadership Fellows Program, um, you know, again, working on this, on, on this kind of question. Um, but I think really in order to really like understand what the pathways are going forward, we have to look at what the history is, right? Um, and, you know, the world of hip hop is in the first place that we've seen this kind of col cultural collaboration between black Americans and, and, uh, uh, and, and the, and Chinese people, right? Uh, you know, the historical context is actually much deeper than that. When you look at, uh, you know, the connection between, uh, and, and frankly, like the, uh, the the real history of radical culture between uh, Black America and China, you know, uh, from uh, Paul Robeson singing Chi Lai, uh, you know, and I think this is in 1929, and the uh, the the uh, singing the Chinese that what would become the Chinese national anthem, the March for the Volunteers, you know, a uh, uh, Black orator and you know. Uh, uh, singer essentially the 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 drake of the 1930s paul robeson uh singing the song in mandarin you know to an audience in in harlem right um you have uh web du bois uh uh connecting with uh Mao, with you know Mao Zedong you know uh and China really representing you know a real uh like force in the black like radical imagination the the black panthers carrying the little red book um, you know, uh, Huey Newton, uh, on behalf of the Viet Cong, rec re recruiting Black Panthers, uh, to fight in the Vietnam War, but on behalf of the Viet Cong. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of these types of connections, um, that I think are interesting to, would be interesting to explore, you know, for the veins of your students as well. A woman is a woman, Shindy Chang Chang. So just as I thought, I was like the first person to do this kind of thing. No, 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 you were beat by like a hundred years, bro, uh, for, by Paul Robeson. And, you know, it really took actually looking back at the history of this kind of solidarity to think about what are the pathways going forward. Um, which I saw that clip way after I produced this video. Chad, no fantastic, show up, no decoys. In the lab, going spastic, Mandarin on the recording. International travel, no need for the pre boarding. Internationalist rapper, proud boys of Bruce Lee, William. Tao Chi Lai, Long Chi Lai, Yi Chi Lai, Shen Dai. Woman, Juryo, Eager, Beach, Omeo, Eager, Ling Wai. Ni Ye, Juryo, Chun Chen, Dread, Digi, Li Hai. So I ended up. You know, involuntarily remixing a song or re or reinvigorating a song, um, uh, but again, because of this pathway of looking back at the history to think about, okay, well, what are the pathways to actually go forward? And so, uh, I kind of wanted to leave, you know, uh, leave folks with this, you know, uh, you know, as a way of thinking, okay, you know, as we're examining all, as social studies teachers and language teachers, as we're examining uh, again the way that 
the uh, China is shaping the future for humanity, you know, uh, good or bad, you know, it will definitely take looking back at those instances of, you know, instances of solidarity and frankly, why China was such a force, you know, and such a revolutionary force. I think it's going to, it owes us to investigate that era and that history to unearth that history in order to think about how we do going forward. Uh, and that culture and hip hop has a huge role to play in that as a global culture uh, that young people right now are living in and living through. Um, so yeah, and you can check out more of my work, more of my work as well uh, at tingbudong.nyc or hit me up on social media. Um, and uh, yeah, and let's stay connected. You know, I, and I'm here to you know for more talks, for more conversations, more questions uh, to connect with your students as well. So hit me up. <laughs>